Hello, everyone. Welcome to KubeCon, and I hope you're all having a great time. Welcome to this roundtable discussion on the evolution of metric monitoring and alerting via Prometheus. My name is Kunal, and I have been contributing to open source ever since I was in my freshman year. Currently, I'm a CNCF intern working on Thanos, and I'm really excited for this particular talk. So let's just start by introducing the speakers that we have for today's panel. Why don't we start with Julius? Yeah, hi there. I'm Julius. I co-founded the Prometheus monitoring system back in 2012 at SoundCloud. Uh, the last years I spent freelancing around it, just helping companies build stuff on top of it, use it, get training, etc. And this year I created my own Prometheus-related company called PromLab. So basically continuing what I've been doing, but also building commercial software on top uh, like PromLens. So yeah, if you need that or any help with Prometheus, please reach out. Yeah, hello, my name is Bjorn. I uh, have been with Prometheus almost from the beginning. Uh, that's a fun story because I kind of watched Julius and Matt Proud, his co-founder, creating it. I thought it's like a very weird idea and nobody will ever use this, but they still lured me over. Like I was sitting, I had this privilege of sitting in Berlin as one of the kind of only Google engineers who could work from, from Berlin back then. And, and yeah, Julius was there at SoundCloud. They invited me for beers and told me the story. And at some point, I don't know if it was just Prometheus or just because they're nice people to work with, I came over and then, then yeah, that was 2013. And um, that's long ago now. And we were starting to work on this, and I have never stopped working on Prometheus ever since. And now I'm here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard. I um, joined Prometheus in 2015. Um, was looking at uh, for a new monitoring solution for for a network for for an ISP. Built a data center, also monitored a data center with Prometheus. Basically, fell in love with with Prometheus immediately because it's just more powerful and you can do actual math on your monitoring data. And I've been around ever since. Yeah, um, my name is Bartek and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat currently. We are doing you know, everything, observability, uh, mainly on OpenShift. Um, however, my journey with Prometheus started four years ago when I was in my previous job as SRE and we were doing at the very beginning rotations between teams and I was supposed to do game engine and I ended up actually uh, exposing metrics and doing observability of Prometheus and I fell in love in that. So um, this is how my journey started. And then uh, I made, I become Prometheus maintainer and we started Thanos as well on the way. Thanks a lot for the introduction, everyone. and. Uh... Before we move forward with like uh, some, some more like we'll we'll be talking about the what Prometheus is and like how it started. So it's uh, even if you're a beginner in Prometheus or someone who is much more experienced, there's the best of both worlds that you can get out of it. But uh, before moving on to all of that, I have just the first question that I have is what is actually what actually is Prometheus and how did it start? So uh, Prometheus is a metrics-based monitoring system that includes a time series database um, that allows you to monitor software, devices, anything that you can really get numeric metrics out of, um, and then either make nice dashboards based on the collected data or also integrate that data into your alerts to wake yourself up at night, <laughs> hopefully not at night, um, to fix a problem uh, and detect these problems. Um, and yeah, how it started. Uh, so I found myself in my dream job at Google in 2012, being a site reliability engineer in Zurich, um, working to keep one of Google's services online and working. And there at Google, we had a great monitoring tool called Borgmon. Everyone hated it, but everyone also said it's the worst tool except for everything else. Um, and when I then left Google to go to SoundCloud to Berlin, uh, ironically, actually, I really liked the job at Google, but I, I really wanted to just go back to my hometown of Berlin after so many years. Um, I was at SoundCloud, uh, and another ex-Googler also joined, Matt Proud. Um, and we were both really missing the kind of monitoring tool, Borgmon, that Google had. And we looked at everything in the open source world back then, and we're really not happy with 
the data model, the UI, the query languages, or complete lack thereof, the efficiency in storage, um, being able to deal with dynamic environments. Um, so SoundCloud back then already had built a complete own cluster scheduler before Docker existed, before Kubernetes existed, many years before that. And there were hundreds of microservices running on that thing with thousands of instances. And it was basically impossible to find out when there was a problem, like a latency spike. Was it all of the instances or just one? Like where, what, what's really happening in detail on that cluster? Um, so we were really convinced that we should at least try to build something that is inspired by Borgmon to help like both our own job, but also create something for the open source world that we could use in our next jobs and that others could use. And um, yeah, we basically started in our free time. And eventually, after it became useful enough, we started introducing it at SoundCloud. And it was still like a long path uh, to actually make it work and make like convince people. I remember talking to Bjorn initially, I think, like in an elevator. And he was like, what? You're recreating Borgmon? This is totally crazy. Um, like, why would you do, do that? And I think, uh, yeah, now, now he's happy. Um, and yeah, but that really helped in the end get a totally different level of insight into what was happening with the microservices in that cluster, um, get way more precise alerting, um, and helped teams work in a totally different way than before, like even testing their own software when it got released and so on. Um, and yeah, then we really finally published it properly with a blog post and everything from SoundCloud and others uh, in 2015. And we didn't really expect it to, you know, we didn't really expect anyone to really get what we're doing because Prometheus does a lot of things differently than other monitoring systems before it with this arcane -ish query language, uh, pull model instead of push for the actual data collection. Um, and like many little other things. But I think it really hit the nerve at that time with people starting to adopt Kubernetes, needing something to monitor stuff running on top of it, and Prometheus really integrating well with dynamic environments by service discovery, which we might get into later. The rest of the story basically, you know, like it got really large adoption from there. Uh, we were really happy. And a year later, roughly, uh, we, we joined the CNCF. And yeah, by now we are we are happy a CNCF project, and it's for some reason became the basically de facto standard in open source monitoring, which uh, is amazing, but was totally not what we set out to do initially. That that is that is in fact really amazing, and like Julius mentioned something about the time series. So like, uh, can someone? Uh, give a bit more insights about the time series for our viewers and like how is it how does it sort of compare from something traditional like nagios yeah i mean i guess i can take that um so nagios was kind of the gold standard in in whatever 2012 2013 when when prometheus started and i mean it's many people are still probably using it and it's doing a good job in certain traditional scenarios but um, there is this one thing that Nagios essentially is you run checks, um, and if they fail, you get an alert. It's kind of this binary thing. Uh, it, it fails or not. The only kind of thing you can do is that you count checks, and if like three out of five fail, then you alert or something like this. has a bit of a time dimension, but there is no real um, time series in there, right? And um, this was. I mean, that existed a bit with like StatsD and Graphite, which was fairly new at this time as well. I mean, it paved the road already. Uh, and kudos for that, definitely. Uh, but then people always thought about dashboards, right? You you write lines on, onto a dashboard. Uh, but uh, like, yeah, this this vision of doing this all in one and have alerting com combined with that, that, that was a really, really important paradigm shift. Uh, we usually tell people the the cool thing is that you can do like it's called trending, I think, uh, where you can say, okay, I don't have to alert if if I cross a threshold if the disk is full, I can actually alert if it's if it's um, getting full, right? So this will allow me to uh, alert way earlier if there's a steep increase in disk usage, and I can totally. Uh, 
right through like 90% disk usage. If this is just constant, it might be fine, right? Um, so this is the one thing. There's also more to that to make alerts more meaningful. Like if you alert on, on like a, a queuing system being behind, you can actually stop alerting if the queue is getting shorter because it's still fairly long and that's bad, but you know the system is already recovering, so you don't, don't need to alert. So that was the one big thing. You could also, um, by time series, you could uh, have this whole notion of a counter where, uh, like, um, I mean, let's say Apache, like ancient Apache already had like this kind of metrics module where it would tell you how many requests it was serving per second and how many it has served altogether. And this is essentially redundant information if you if you just record in a time series database how this counter evolves, then you can take a rate, like differentiate the, the counter, and you, you get the rate, and you can actually uh, define if you want the rate over the last minute or last 10 minutes. It's so much more powerful, but it requires you to record this as a time series. And that's what Prometheus did, and it unlocked an enormous amount of, of things you could do. And it was not just for drawing lines in a dashboard, it was also for alerting. And the other thing is that we labeled those time series. And that was uh, where we went from like those dotted hierarchical strings from graphite that's the, to a labeled model, which is like non-hierarchical, and you can slice and dice along all these dimensions. That's really important, what Julia said, to really go down to, to certain um, failure cases or root causes. And um, this is, was such a nice coincidence that Kubernetes also labels everything, right? So Kubernetes came out when we were already done with the Prometheus prototype, essentially. And the Kubernetes people, they could have noticed what we we're doing with Prometheus, but they, they didn't know, right? It was an open repository, but nobody knew it. And then it came out, it both it was like Greek words, Kubernetes and Prometheus. They are both 10 letter words. So you could say K8S and P8S. The logos are like exactly complementary colors, orange and blue. So for anybody outside, it looked like this was designed on purpose to work together and, and to fit together. But it's not true. It's like really converging evolution, essentially. And also, like you can do a lot of Prometheus monitoring for non-Kubernetes systems. Like at SoundCloud, we did it for our own homegrown orchestration platform, but you can do it, use it for everything. It's not, it's really separate developments, but it played perfectly together. And that's also, I guess, the reason why the first two projects in this CNCF are Kubernetes and Prometheus. Absolutely, I, and yeah, that was really, yeah, go ahead. So I, I just want to, to make one shout out to Sebex, because even back then it was, doing time series, it was pull-based, at least mainly you could also do push. It allowed you to do basic math. Um, still, Prometheus blew it out of the water, but already back then you had something which was, it, it has all the main things, but not as, as nicely integrated as Prometheus did it. Yeah, absolutely. That was a really good explanation for like why Prometheus started, what it is. But I'm currently like, uh, let's say I want to use my, let's say I have a Java application. So uh, how, if I want to use Prometheus, then how do I actually like send the metrics to Prometheus? So how does that usually work? And that's why, you know, Prometheus is very unique in this field, um, because you don't actually send metrics to Prometheus. Prometheus collects that metric value from your application. And this is the, you know, sometimes controversial uh, discussion between pull and push model. So Prometheus is primarily a pull model here. Um, it allows you to configure um, certain scrape targets and uh, and certain interval with, uh, the, you know, how often you collect certain metrics. And uh, with uh, simple HTTP endpoint, you know, page that you expose in each of your applications, um, you just point Prometheus to those endpoints and Prometheus will collect this, the data from those endpoints um, uh, periodically. And um, this is essentially how Prometheus collects uh, in regular intervals um, the values of your metrics that are exposed within your application. And that was pretty novel, you know, back then when Prometheus started because everyone used to uh, something called like black box or close box uh, monitoring where, for example, in Nagios, you were creating scripts around 
um, around your system that checks from outside what is happening within your application. Right now, it's um, there is this direction of um, exposing more observability kind of signals within your application. So maybe you can count, you know, your queue uh, sizes, um, HTTP, you know, uh, request and server latency and, and stuff like that, which is extremely important. And um, you do that by not pushing this data to, um, to some monitoring system, but actually just um, allowing some other system to collect it. And Prometheus leverage that. Um, this um, well, this may, might mean that you know the code um, has to be instrumented. Like you need to use some client library in, and, and there are plenty of um, libraries um, for for the major you know languages available, um, and and supported by either community or Prometheus maintainers. Um, but at the end, um, with this, it's much much easier and more efficient than uh, pushing metrics because you don't need to worry from the client perspective on the application into you know how to um, handle failover scenarios, um, rate limits, retries, how do you buffer this data. Essentially, you can perform pretty stateless applications and, and have reliable monitoring on top of that. Um, this also allows you to simplify discovery and configuration, so make it kind of top-down discovery. Um, and I think Julius, you can tell more about that. Yeah. So once you have those applications that have instrumentation, like an HTTP endpoint where Prometheus can pull metrics from, the next question is, how does Prometheus know where it should pull from? Um, obviously, the simplest way would be to just statically configure some endpoints in your Prometheus configuration. But that worked maybe 20 years ago when you had these static database servers and a web server, and they never change. Uh, nowadays, you have <laughs> cloud instances popping up, going down. You have Kubernetes on top. You have on top of that Kubernetes, like many changing microservice instances. And the key here is service discovery. So Prometheus can integrate with different types of service discovery in your infrastructure. The most prominent one would be uh, the Kubernetes service discovery, where it continuously talks to the Kubernetes API server to get a constantly updated view of what should exist in the world, right? So for a monitoring system, it's really important to know what should be there and what is it. And so Prometheus um, know, uses service discovery information. Let's go with a Kubernetes example, but there's others, uh, to know what should be there, how do I pull from it, and then also enrich the pulled time series data with information it got from service discovery. So it will know what kind of pod it's pulling from in Kubernetes, for example, um, which kind of environment is in, what's the pod name, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, that just really helps Prometheus um, deal with these dynamic environments and allows you to define alerts when Prometheus is trying to pull from something that currently should be there but isn't because Prometheus will also not notice that automatically. Um, and yeah, so there are service discoveries integrated uh, in Prometheus for uh, instances of the different cloud providers, for Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, DNS, Zookeeper, and some other ones. Uh, and there's also a, an interface to plug in your custom one. And um, Potentially, if it's uh, if if you are missing a built-in service discovery in Prometheus that is for something really popular, um, we might be able to include it in Prometheus itself. And this also has a political angle, of course. Um, while we have that system which which allows you to nicely transport your metric data, um, this is inherently tied to the name of Prometheus. And we got hundreds back then, thousands these days of integrations and exporters from people running their own stuff or instrumenting their own stuff, writing their own exporters. Of course, they needed it for their own things. Yet there was this political angle of uh, competing projects or competing uh, vendors not wanting to support something which, which carried the name of Prometheus, which is why uh, Open Metrics was started which is basically an effort to, to standardize the Prometheus exposition format with some slight changes. Um, and it's been, that concept has been in use for like five years now. 
Uh, we are actually, and I'm really meaning this, we are close to uh, to publishing the actual draft within the I uh, ITF. Just yesterday night, we finished the to-do list, so we have the final punishing. Um, so what is this? It's basically just taking Prometheus Exposition Format, taking all that goodness, putting it into its own thing, so you don't have that political angle of supporting something from a competing uh, product, while also allowing you to, to have an official standard within IETF where you can just say, okay, RFC one, two, three, please support this, which is especially important when you come to uh, networking hardware or more traditional vendors. Of course, they usually work on, on IETF standards, at least in the, in the networking space. So this is why, um, why, why I started this, because it's just important to, to not only have Prometheus as this super nice, efficient, powerful data engine and framework for doing your observability, but also permeating this concept of label-based metrics throughout the whole ecosystem, throughout this industry and other industries. And that's basically the intention behind this. And I think uh, it's kind of working, which is super nice. Mm. And again, within weeks, we will actually publish the standard. Yeah. <laughs> No, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that. That was uh, that's really helpful. But uh, the, the, the like Bartek mentioned about you know the pull versus push mechanism. So, what if like the question that I have, even from like the viewer's point of view, so how do I actually like uh, fetch the data and actually like visualize it, uh, to visualize the data that I have collected? So, how does that usually go? Yeah. So. There is a query language called PromQL in Prometheus, which really forms the heart of building alerts, building dashboards, but also doing ad hoc debugging, digging around in your data. Um, and this query language was initially inspired by what we were used to in Borgmon at Google. Uh, and now it's, it's, of course, not exactly the same, but it uses similar principles. And it is not a SQL-like language, like you would find in some other time series databases, but a more functional language, which just allows you to select data and then wrap more and more and more transformations around the selected data. And I think some of the core features that really make it powerful is that you can do math between whole sets of time series. For example, dividing a whole set of error rates by a whole set of total rates, for example, automatically joining them on either completely identical label sets or related label sets, so there's modifiers you can use. Um, so it allows a level of insight and math between time series that wasn't really seen before that. Um, it is admittedly, it has some sharp edges um, and is different from what people are used to in query languages. Um, but I think it really pays off and it allows you to do, you know, very precise alerts as well. Yeah, thanks, Julius. And uh, what about visualizing the data that I have collected? So there is there are several approaches to this. Obviously, you have the UI built into Prometheus itself, which uh, is super nice for exploring your data and which I still uh, use quite often because it's just very snappy and, and nice. Um, but there's also something which is called PromDash, which was the dashboarding tool for Prometheus. Um, and it is an absolute pain to use and to create dashboards uh, with PromDash. I never liked it. Um, and just by happenstance, also around the same time, 2014, I think it was, um, Torkel founded uh, or started the Grafana project initially to visualize uh, graphite data. But there was a plugin for for um, for Prometheus as well within within a few months, I think. And basically, as I was mentioning, I was trying to find new monitoring for for my for my internet or for my backbone, um, and was looking at both Grafana and Prometheus at the same time, and just kept using the two with each other while mainly ignoring Promdash because it was just so painful. And at some point, talking with Carl, I just realized, hey, why don't we try and make Grafana the actual default recommendation for Prometheus? 
which we discussed within, I don't think Prometheus team existed back then, but like within within the group, which was around Prometheus, we discussed this and, and basically decided that yes, this is not the focus of Prometheus anyway. And having uh, something which is taking care of actually the visualization part for, for fixed dashboards is absolutely nice. And something which helps the project in as much as we don't have to focus on this. Of course, these days, uh, Grafana has the Explore UI, which basically mirrors and even enhances what you have within Prometheus proper, which doesn't mean that that doing it within Prometheus is still not also um, fully fully OK and, and sometimes the quickest way to get something done. But for dashboards, basically, we switched the official recommendation towards Grafana in either 2015 or 16, I think. I think 15. Yeah, thanks a lot, Richie. I do have a follow-up question on that. Um, like uh, when we're using like monitoring and alerting tools, so one of the one of the reasons and one of the most uh, like advantages that we can take off is uh, figuring out and detecting the incidents that might cause you know some some damages. So, do I need to glare at these dashboards to de detect those incidents, or is there like another like better way to do that? No, that's exactly what what was the kind of one of the primary goals of Prometheus. Um, um, Prometheus was not only about dashboarding, graphing those data, it's, it's really about alerting and kind of reactive work and, and focusing on incidents only when, uh, and on focusing on running workloads only when, when there is some, something wrong going on. So um, this is kind of a natural ev evolution when someone introduced a monitoring. Uh, first, there was no monitoring. Then, for example, Prometheus is introduced and they try to, um, you know, visualize some data, some some health of the system, and then you set up an alert so you can actually stop, you know, looking on those health system to, to monitor yourself. You can actually let Prometheus to monitor for you, and um, this is really, really kind of novel and amazing and kind of the way going forward because you can as an you know operator devops sre you can focus on feature work um you know expanding your business um instead of operating and manually watching you know health of your system um and uh, you can you know configure let's say rules that will trigger um, an alert that will be sent uh, to alert manager, which is part of the Prometheus ecosystem. And alert manager allows you to route to the um, notification system um, uh, of your choice. It can route to PagerDuty or um, other kind of systems that allows you to send message to your phone, Slack, whatever, email, Jira. Um, and what is also revolutionary here is that you can actually um, trigger an alert on the symptom of potential incident that will happen uh, soon, potentially. For example, you know, disk space is running low, or you predict that the CPU saturation will happen soon because there is like growing increase and nothing is uh, is going down. Uh, or maybe memory uh, utilization is, is constantly growing, so you predict that will you run out of the memory soon. So you can actually predict that ahead of time um, um, <clears throat> and and essentially react faster. But the true kind of value in, in true truly automated kind of system infrastructure monitoring is um, kind of SLO based alerts. And this is kind of there's huge ecosystem and lots of talks around and tools around around that. I really recommend um, the tool that wrote uh, Matthias, my coworker. Um, it's called Prom Tools, and it lets you generate, you know, error budget uh, based SLOs, which um, you define, you know, the, the service level objective that you care for, because you don't care if one user maybe request fails. You care if, you know, a, a significant amount of users um, cannot reach your service, for example, for some amount of time that is maybe, um, you know, described in the contract. So you can alert, you can, you know, adjust the alerting to match those um, contract behavior and also only be notified uh, for, you know, human response um, only if very, very needed um, to avoid noise. Yeah, uh, that answers my question. Thanks a lot for sharing. And I just have one more question for Julius. Like, uh, what was the what was the naming uh, inspiration behind Prometheus? Like, we know for Thanos, it's uh, Marvel Avengers and stuff like that. Then there's Loki, and uh, what was the inspiration behind like yeah. Prometheus name? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, we 
initially we just needed a name so we did what everyone does we went through wikipedia lists of greek gods and goddesses and all titans and all that and eventually we did stumble over prometheus and a it wasn't taken yet in that relevant space we could even get the github org of course it existed already at the time but it was not used so github actually gave it to us but also we just noticed like the symbolism fit nicely um a we kind of you know Prometheus stole fire from the gods and brought it to the humans, the outside world. In a way, I wouldn't say, okay, <laughs> I would say we we were inspired by Google's Borgmon and built something like that uh, for the open world. Um, and the second meaning is the fire, right? Like a monitoring system gives you insight as does fire. So it's illuminating things and the torch is is, is a nice symbol for that. So yeah, it worked out really well. And the fact that then all these other cloud native tools also ended up with Greek names like Kubernetes and, and Istio and so on, uh, that was a complete coincidence. All righty. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining and uh, everyone who is uh, watching this and uh, will be also available to answer any questions live. So do make sure that if you have any questions, any follow-up questions, you can ask those. and. Uh, have a great KubeCon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.